Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome again to uh, International Marketing. Uh, this is Chapter 1. I will go over the PowerPoint slides with you. Um, I um, Usually, the this is, again, what I'm used to is lecturing in class. This is my online class, and I thought the best way for me to, to make sure that everybody gets this is to go over the slides with you the way that I do in class. Um, the last time I did this, was when I taught at the Chino Women's Prison, and we recorded the PowerPoint uh, slides this way, and I think we had really good results. So please, again, feel free to let me know if there's anything you want me to do uh, differently. We'll rely on the slides for now because I know many of you were not able to get the ebook. All right, so the first chapter is a bit of a recap for a lot of you uh, who already took global business, and for the rest of you, I think it'll be a very interesting chapter. We're gonna open up our mind um, this is when we take what we know about uh, international, uh, I'm sorry, about business and we apply it on a global scale. So these are the slides from your author. I did uh, just put them on uh, our website on the, uh, Canvas and I, uh, the, the slides themselves. And what, what I'll do here is I'll also post this as well so that now you'll be able to um, hear the lecture and see the slides at the same time. All right, let's get going. So, um, well, maybe I spoke too soon. Here we go. There we go. So international marketing defined. Um, first basic, basic definition here consists of an activity, an institution, and processes uh, across national border. So we're taking marketing. Uh, you recognize the definition. And uh, we're taking that definition across the board, uh, across the borders, sorry. Very basic. Now, more specifically, we're creating, we're communicating, and we're delivering, and finally exchanging offerings that could be uh, tangible or intangibles, right? Uh, services count, ideas count, uh, and we're, we're doing this uh, to deliver value for stakeholders in society. Uh, stakeholder, anyone who has something at stake uh, from the uh, interaction, right? So stockholder is a stakeholder, uh, anybody who has, um, uh, if you think about a factory and you think about the um, person who cuts hair and who has his business just on the outside of the factory, if the factory closed, they would lose their business maybe. That's an example of a, of a, of a stakeholder. There's lots of examples of stakeholders that uh, we'll cover more later on, but just kind of a recap for basic marketing. Um, I, um, I made exchanges and value. I uh, changed the font color to red because obviously that is the heart of um, marketing and advertising, right? Delivering value. And of course, the exchange takes place uh, between the company and the person who's uh, purchasing. The, um, why, why do we do this? Why do we want to even bother? Um, some people think, you know, this is the greatest nation in the world. We are so amazing. Why do we care? Well, this this is a really cool map. I love this. Check it out. Just take your time. So this is uh, the latest I could I could get, which is of course last year. But this is a geographic map that has been modified so that the countries, the size of the country is displaced based on the population of the country. So obviously what you notice very quickly is that China and India are the two biggest. Um, most of you already know this. But yes, so China is at, um, at 1.4 uh, and then India is at 1.35. Um, the growth rate of the population of India is outpacing that of China, which means within the next five years uh, India will have the largest population on the planet. Uh, to give you a little perspective why international marketing and in fact international business is so critical, there's 326 million Americans over here, about the population of Europe, well, European Union, and, uh, and look at Canada. Uh, just as an aside, uh, the population of Canada is inferior to that of the state of California. Uh, we have more people living in California than there are Canadians. Uh, anyway, so I hope that helps you kind of um, 
really, if, if anybody needs to be convinced, which usually in this class, that's not, that's not the case, but uh, you could try to rely on a market of 326 million people, uh, or you just if you had to pick one and you just decided that China was the market you'd want to go for, I want you to consider that if we were to look at the U.S. population in billions, we would be 0 0.3 billion people. We are not even the 0.4 billion of the Chinese population. That's how big that population is. Anyway, uh, some food for thought. Um, there's 7 plus billion people on planet Earth and uh, the wise uh, organizations are the ones that are taking advantage of the rest of the demand. All right, so let's move along. International marketing defined. There are different forms of international marketing. Now, having said that, when you think about international marketing, uh, that is tied to international business, right? So, of course, we're talking about uh, maybe let's use a product. Man, maybe there's a car and you sell this car in the U.S., right? And uh, you're thinking, well, I'd like to sell this car overseas, right? There's different ways of doing that. So uh, there's the export-import trade. Boom, done. I'm going to put a bunch of Buicks in a boat, and I'm going to ship them out uh, to China. That's one way. There's a licensing agreement. The licensing agreement uh, is uh, where, for example, you think about Nike. Nike selling shoes all over the world, right? Well, obviously, Nike is not going to export its shoes uh, just from one place to, to the other place. And uh, it's not interested in having factories all over the world. So what Nike will do is enter into licensing agreement with factories. And so they will make their Nike shoes for them. And Nike will give them a cut, right? So they'll pay a percentage fee. That's a licensing agreement. Joint ventures. Uh, there's lots and lots of joint ventures out there. Um, aerospace, right? So for example... When you think about jet engines, uh, you think about maybe General Electric making jet engines. That's the biggest uh, jet engine manufacturer in the, in the world. Rolls-Royce is another one. Uh, there's a bunch of French companies that also uh, make uh, jet engines. And uh, what, what ended up happening a while ago is that they were starting to really compete with GE so much so that GE decided that it was in its best interest to uh, partner up with some of these uh, French companies. And so if you Google uh, CFM, uh, you'll see uh, that uh, these are uh, very popular jet engines. Uh, most of the short hops airline we take are on CFM motors. Uh, Boeing uh, loves CFM uh, engines, so they're on most of their 777. Wholly owned subsidiary, that's it. You um, want uh, international presence and uh, you either will have your own branch somewhere that you create from scratch or you might even buy one um, uh, in that other country there uh, if that's the direction you want to take. It could be related to your business, it could be unrelated, but that's just a strategy there. Um, I'm going a little bit fast in this section just to kind of give you some uh, recap for those of you who already know it and a feel for those of you who are not familiar with the stuff. But uh, this is again what we uh, spent a little bit, well actually a lot more time covering in the Global Business, uh, the Business 61 class. Turnkey operations are quite interesting. If you think about um, a franchise, uh, McDonald's, let's just go with McDonald's, right? McDonald's is an interesting uh, uh, business concept because you, you're having McDonald's um, really control everything from A to Z, right? So they'll pick the location. They'll actually uh, be responsible for the construction of the building. Often they own the building outright uh, and uh, the licensee or franchisee who happens to be a licensee will pay um, a type of lease agreement on the building. If you think about that, if you think about McDonald's going overseas, right? I use the example of North Korea, which sounds totally absurd, right? North Korea, what? M McDonald's would not want to go to North Korea. There, there's no trade, there's nothing happening. It's a, it's a hermit. Uh, uh, government, there's, there's uh, anyway, you, you, I think you don't need to go into a lot of details about North Korea. Well, what happened in the 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s, is it's exactly what McDonald's did in a place that was once known um, as the Soviet Union. It was the first place to uh, cut a deal uh, with the government there. Anyway, 
the way that it uh, that you can do that is is a, a turnkey operation is when you decide to go to a country and uh, you're responsible for everything and uh, you you build the factory you teach the people how to do it the whole thing mcdonald's is usually a very any franchise is really a turnkey operation not to confuse you but they're also licensing agreements so a franchise is a licensing agreement also management contracts that's it so it's just basically very similar to what we've been talking about where someone is uh, contracting out with a company with the rights to manage uh, a, a, an organization let's continue on making decisions based on international issues and the repercussions require addressing the below questions number one where are my current and potential customers I think I made the case pretty clear when I showed you that map with the international uh, population um, you can if you want to keep it within your national boundaries economically it is a, a, a massive mistake if you think about it this way uh, we're all familiar with General Motors General Motors um, made some poor decisions that led to its bankruptcy uh, yes uh, a lot of people will say well hold on uh, the uh, financial crisis uh, we had a massive recession uh, you know, economic collapse in the United States. Isn't that what led GM to go bankrupt? Well, interesting story. Uh, GM was already um, really in the red for years prior to its bankruptcy. Uh, there was a book uh, published by an auto analyst, uh, Micheline Maynard, called The End of Detroit, which was actually calling out for um, GM uh, 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 that it would go bankrupt. Uh, and she wrote that book, I believe, about 10 years prior to the bankruptcy. So why am I telling you all that? GM went bankrupt and uh, we bailed out GM. We uh, taxpayers bailed out General Motors. What was fascinating was to see how quickly GM came out of bankruptcy. It was really interesting. One of the uh, number one reasons that GM came, came out uh, so fast out of bankruptcy was because of China. Um, uh, one of uh, GM's brand is very special to the Chinese market. The last emperor of China drove this car, it was gifted to him. And so this American brand is actually very dear to the Chinese cultural DNA. And that brand is Buick. And Buick is a very, very popular brand uh, with uh, Chinese consumers. Demand is really hot. Uh, General Motors uh, sold more Buicks in China uh, than it did uh, in the U.S. and uh, because of demand it helped uh, GM pay back its debt to the government uh, in, earlier than predicted uh, with the bailout. Again, when you think about where your current customers are, where your potential customers are, it is really smart to think beyond your borders and it'll pay off one day. Um, does my need to have market have borders? Uh, that's the other thing. Where, um, if you think about the product or service that uh, you are selling, uh, that are you creating the border? The borders uh, as a company, do they have borders? Are they worth for you to target? What are the uh, uh, different uh, elements of the demand that might fit what the the product or service offering is that you're providing? Does the international activity increase the risk? Now, that's a big one. Um, again, this is a, we, we have a whole chapter on this in Global Business where we talk about uh, risk, different types of risk, right? So when you think about risk, first of all, let's, let's, let's just kind of really quickly recap. This will not be on the exam for those of you who are trying to get all that stuff. It's just a quick recap. When you think about, when you think about risk and you're thinking about um, how to analyze external uncontrollable risk. There are several strategic tools out there that we use to assess that. Uh, the common one is a SWOT analysis. That's, that's probably the most common, the first one that many business uh, majors will, will, will study. And what we learn from the SWOT analysis, the strategic analysis, is how to assess internal and external issues. When you look at risk, and also opportunities, by the way, uh, we're looking at the external uncontrollable environment. So what are we looking at? Legal, environment, political, social, global, technological, competitive, environmental. All of those are external uncontrollable environmental risks. 
So when you're asking, uh, does the international activity increase risk, you have to really look at the market. You have to decide uh, how you're going to launch whatever it is that you're trying to launch overseas. There's a pattern in terms of how businesses usually decide to go international. The number one step is export. It's very easy. I make the product here already anyway. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. And as demand goes up, then you have decisions to make. Uh, exporting is going to really start to be costly. So you uh, cooperate with other people in the other country. Uh, you have existing business that see that we could, this could be a win-win if we uh, uh, work with you. It could be a joint venture. It could be a strategic alliance. It could turn into a merger acquisition. Uh, and some companies decide we're just going to build it there in the first place. Um, General Electric, um, famously uh, about, uh, I want to say 10 years ago, built its entire factory in Brazil because it saw opportunity there at the time uh, to uh, manufacture locomotives. So uh, General Electric locomotives were are built in Brazil by General Electric. Uh, has that increased risk? Yes, it has, big time, uh, because of the economic climate of Brazil. Uh, the last two Presidents of Brazil are, uh, are indicted for fraud. They're going to prison. Uh, the new president of Brazil um, has made some statements that have uh, not um, really helped uh, boost foreign direct investment confidence into Brazil. Um, he's a pretty far right guy. Anyway, so having said all that, yes, risk. Uh, GE took a hit because it went there and uh, now it's kind of on standby to see what's going to happen to the demand. Anyway, there's an organization called Control Risks. Uh, they're a, a, a pretty big company, and what they do is they help corporations assess risk uh, throughout the world, different types of risk, economic risk, but also conflict, political risk. Um, they have uh, something called the political risk map uh, that we, again, we, we talk about in Global. International marketing defined. So what marketing adjustments are or will be necessary? So I use... I use this example here of uh, the Buick LaCrosse. Uh, I'll have you guys look it up. It's a fun little, you know, one of the cool things, or I think fun things about international marketing is the blunders, right? There's so many blunders. And my students are always blown away when we find out like, what, this multinational corporation went to this other country and picked the wrong name or picked a name that said something super offensive. How's that even possible? You know, that, oh, I see it happened a long time ago. Well. What's interesting, excuse me, what's interesting is that the stuff, you, you know, it still happens. And in this particular case, we're talking about uh, Buick LaCrosse General Motors um, exporting this uh, brand to Quebec, right, uh, French-speaking Canada. So this one is one that I'll let you guys uh, search, Buick LaCrosse Quebec, see what the headlines are, and you'll understand massive, massive blunder there. Um, and obviously, you'll maybe agreed that they should have changed their name. Things don't translate well sometimes. What threats from global competition should I expect? Uh, here's the deal. Um, you know, the one, of the one of the problems that many big multinationals have is once they start to gain market share and become the market leader, number one, two, or three, there's a tendency for them to think, well, we got this, we know what we're doing, status quo. And the problem with that is uh, you can't relax. You always have to stay hungry. You have to, basically, you have to act like you're in the back of the pack and you're trying to move to the head of the pack. If you get a little bit cocky, a little confident, bad things happen and uh, someone will, will, will come in and eat your market share. So yes, those are real threats and those are real questions. Uh, how do innovation and entrepreneurship change the global marketplace? This one is fascinating. Lots of things going on there. Innovation, right? Well, uh, there's lots of ways of, uh, of looking at innovation and uh, the benefit of innovation. Um, one of the ways that I like to just kind of simplify it is for you guys to think about your iPhone. When Steve Jobs launched the uh, Apple iPhone, it really just absolutely was amazing. It's changed everything. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, some of you are too young to remember this, but prior to the iPhone, let's look at what the, you know, the landscape was. It was just uh, what they called smartphones where flip up phones or maybe that little keyboard on there with tiny, tiny little keys. So, so Apple comes up with this thing and what does it do? 
now it's not just a phone, right? It's a, it's an iPod, it's a camera, it's got little apps. It's basically a mini computer. Think about, you know, ask your parents, and some of you maybe are old enough to remember this, but think about prior to the iPhone what life was like, right? So uh, you're in your car, you're going somewhere, you, you bought a little Tom Tom or a little Garmin, paid a couple hundred bucks at Costco, and you had that thing in your car. Well, that's done. Now you use your phone. You bought a digital camera when you traveled. Well, you use your phone. You had a little iPod. You use your phone. Your kid, they wanted a little, I don't know, um, mobile little video game. Now they have their own phone and they download the apps for the video games. You get the idea. This innovation disrupted billions of dollars worth of industry by coming in as a new entrant for competition. Innovation is uh, one of the leading reasons why the American economy is where it is today, right? All of these inventions that create other businesses. We don't have a monopoly on innovation, which is why you're seeing a lot of uh, effort uh, with STEM, right? Um, why? Well, because it's great to talk about critical thinking, but if you don't have the, the, the you know, intellectual uh, horsepower to back that up in research and development, come up with new innovation, uh, somebody else is going to do that. So anyway, that's, that's out there. Moving along, um, let's see, oh, maybe not moving along. The importance of world trade. Within the last decade, world trade represents a growth of 140% uh, for trade in both merchandise and service. So that just, again, gives you an idea, right? What uh, the author is not telling you here is that uh, what's fascinating is when if you were to look at trade in terms of uh, one item, just think of it like a computer, right? So people think like, okay, I'm using a Dell right now, Dell laptop that's uh, made in China. So a lot of people will associate this Dell with, okay, one unit of production equals one trade, right? They're thinking my Dell here was made in China and that unit of production was met was one unit of trade as it was shipped from China to the US. Well, that would be absolutely incorrect. There hundreds of trade patterns uh, that took place for this laptop to be built in the first place, right? All of the components, sub-components uh, that came from all over the world. Uh, they're, they're components that travel four or five times with just one sub, four or five sub-components for one component between multiple countries. Um, it's actually in the news right now, if you're following the news, so um, uh, the current president has made a statement that he wants to shut down the Mexico border. And uh, all of these business publications are out there kind of doing the math, going like, what would that mean economically? And the auto industry would be one of the first hit because they would say that they, they, most analysts say within one week, uh, American uh, auto manufacturers would have to shut down. And they're talking about components, like one component for car seats goes back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. four times before it is actually finished in Mexico, put in a car that's then imported back in the U.S. That's just the nature of trade. Global growth of trade has outperformed the growth of domestic economies in the past few decades. So hopefully that makes sense for everyone right now. Uh, you know, the, um, we, the, the key word, for those of you who are new to this, the key word when we talk about trade is interdependence, interdependence. We are all dependent on one another as countries, and that has to do with specialization, right? We all specialize in different things. And a lot of people go, well, why can't we be like, you know, independent? Why, you know, wouldn't we be great if we were sovereign? Well, I always uh, remind my students, there is such a place. There is a country like that. It is called North Korea. Very independent, totally sovereign, right? Not really working out. Um, international specialization and cross-sourcing have made production efficient. Kind of going back to what I just said. Uh, specialization, let's go with that. Um, countries specialize in different things. What do we specialize in? You know, if you think about for a second, what do we really specialize? Well, look at the most valuable companies in the world, just the top 50. A lot of them are American. And what are they going to be? They're going to be financial institutions. Uh, they're going to be uh, anything tied to um, 
the internet, right? Uh, they're going to be out of Silicon Valley. We're talking about Apple. The top three to four uh, most valuable companies in the world tend to be, uh, depending on the you know time of day, uh, it's going right now. The last time I checked with my students, um, we saw that Microsoft was the most valuable company in the world, um, and and then after that it was uh, Alphabet, which is a company that owns Google, uh, and then after that it was Apple, and of course Exxon and all these guys are up there. Exxon's climbing back up because uh, the uh, cost of oil is going back up. You get the idea. So specialization, you specialize and that's going to help with uh, cross-sourcing, right? There are things we're just not interested in doing anymore because we'd rather use our resources um, in production uh, toward things that uh, work out better for us. That, you know, think about uh, a lawyer, right? What does a lawyer do? They're sitting there and they're listening to uh, the person and they're writing down on their notepad and the, their resource was their brain, right? They got paid a lot of money to use their brain. Same with an accountant, IT people, etc. You get a lot more that way than you do if uh, you're using your muscles, right? If you're working, building, manufacturing something, right? All right. Uh, let's see. New and emerging economies have liberalized their economic systems. So let's see if this works. I have a little hyperlink here. Let's see if it pulls up. Oops, wrong screen. Okay, here we go. So this is about um, economic freedom, right? So um, economic freedom is a way to track how welcoming the country is uh, to foreign investments, right? So you want to start a company overseas and some countries are going to make it super easy, basic for you to get there and others are going to really just have red tape galore. And so this is showing you like the top most welcoming economies in the world. And yes, Hong Kong, Singapore are always up there top two. Uh, then New Zealand and Australia are there, Switzerland's there too, and then Ireland, right? Um, you know, so uh, we're up there, the U.S., but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're down over here, you know, past uh, Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some are going up, some are going down. You know, you see Australia has been going down a notch here and Canada has been going down. So maybe there's more regulations lately coming out of Canada. Who knows? And then, of course, you know, the, you, you know, if you want to go like really like avoid going to North Korea, well, there we go. I mean, you know, wow, they're going up a little bit. Uh, Venezuela, all of these countries. Uh, the, 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 these countries make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do business, right? So we call that the Economic Freedom Index, which is a way of kind of measuring doing business overseas. What you, the reason I, I showed you this right now uh, is uh, to kind of uh, make the case that, yes, most economies in the world have understood if I liberalize my economic system, right, if I make things more open, more transparent, I'm more likely to get foreign direct investment. I'm more likely to have uh, foreign uh, factories come into my country. Why is that good for me? Well, I hire more people. I pay taxes and taxes go to this government. Um, when a factory uh, opens up that makes cars, what, what does it mean? Well, you have a lot more people who are driving trucks. You have, a lot more, you have all these feeder businesses that are going to sell parts to that factory and they usually want to be close by. You have more accountants, you have more lawyers, you have more secretaries, you get the idea. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, it's bringing billions of new consumers in the global economic system, right? Uh, and so when you think about this, earlier we were talking about uh, opportunity outside of the US. I showed you this map uh, with the world population and the representation of the country accordingly. So now let's look at the global economic system and let's see what we got here in terms of, uh, in this case, a uh, list of countries by GDP per capita, right? And so this is kind of interesting because it's showing you what people make on average in the country, the actual citizens, right? Uh, this is from the IMF, this is from the World Bank, this is from the CIA. So 2017, more or less, they're all about the same. Qatar, right? So oil rich nation kind of makes sense, Macau, uh, tax haven, Luxembourg, tax haven. So the top three, nah, I'm not convinced. I mean, a lot of these countries, they rank so high uh, because um, they have uh, incentives for investors, right? Singapore is also uh, very uh, popular with investors, but 
uh, what Singapore has done, and I think you remember it from the other list I just showed you, it's one of the top economies in the world uh, for uh, uh, investments, right? Um, not investment in terms of the tax haven, but in terms of making it very easy for people to do business there. You get the idea. These are, you know, for uh, uh, in terms of what people owe, uh, what people make per year on average. If you're going to spend uh, money on selling stuff, you kind of want to know how much people make, right? And you go down this list, and you know the CAR, Central African Republic, that's six hundred and eighty-one dollars a year on average, right? Uh, and so it kind of gives you an idea. Um, all right, so moving along. Um, offering a vast array of new marketing opportunities is, an, is another one for world trade, right? Uh, and again, it's needs and wants, but when someone brings a new product in, a, in an economy, people don't know, they realize, they don't realize they have a need until it shows up, right? And so that creates more opportunities outside of the country where uh, the innovation came up. Bringing in production efficiencies through international specialization cross-sourcing. Uh, there's lots of ways you could go with that, but just just keep it simple. Think farming, right? Um, because of efficiencies and uh, economies of scales, American farmers have been really uh, clever at trying to be extremely efficient in how they farm. So they're using capital, right? They're, they're, they're using money uh, to buy equipment, and the equipment makes them uh, way more efficient, right? They use satellites. I mean, just now with uh, the technology that's out there, they're, they're talking about uh, these uh, farmers basically in the morning, turning the computer on and having um, the uh, equipment just uh, uh, mine the field uh, without human uh, interaction being necessary because everything's automated, right? Anyway, so you take that technology in the U.S. and once it's been tried and it works, then of course um, we can export that and bring in new specialization, uh, I'm sorry, a, a new technology overseas. Redefining the way business is done through revolutionary technology. So that piggybacks into what I just talked about. World trade. So now we're talking about something called a trade block. Uh, B-L-O-C, not B-L-O-C-K. Trade block. Um, sorry. I'm going back to the trade block. So when you think about a trade block, just think about a group of countries that have decided that they're better off making deals with each other, having agreements, um, than fighting each other, right? And fighting each other economically. And so, um, just to kind of give you a little recap, again, for those of you who already know this, um, if you th go back to World War II, 1939-1945, uh, and uh, right after World War II, uh, uh, the Allies, uh, ratify this agreement uh, called the General Agreement on Tariff of Trade, GATT. And what GATT does is it leads to eventually uh, what we have today as a World Trade Organization. But since then, what countries realize is that economically, they're much better off uh, partnering up with their neighboring countries, because usually it's geographically, uh, trade blocks almost always, always, uh, neighbors who trade with each other, they're better off agreeing to disagree on some things and, uh, and, and, and lowering tariffs, right? So taxes, for example. Uh, if you uh, use an old example, so if you, uh, uh, Western Europe, right? So uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, England, they used to slap taxes to each other all the time, right? It was uh, coal, uh, steel, textile, stuff like that. And uh, it would really jack up the price of everything, right? Uh, that leads to a, a recession, depression, and well, in their case, a bunch of wars too. Um, but so what happens is when you agree and you say, okay, fine, listen, I don't like you trying to sell this product in my country because you're, uh, you're able to sell it for less than uh, my industry can sell it. And it's hurting my industry. But I know that if I put a tariff on you, you'll put one on me with this other product I sell in your country. So what I'll do is I'll have to tell my industry, hey, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to let them come in because I have to choose between what's best for you, this industry, and the whole population at large, right? Because if 
you engage in these tariffs and taxes, you artificially jack up the price of everything, right? And then you start to really affect things. Disposable income goes down, uh, business goes down, the economy starts to slide. It's just ugly. So that's why we have trade blocks. Um, the uh, trade block for the United States is a very weak trade block. Uh, it's the lowest level of what we call trade integration or one of the lowest levels. Uh, it's called a trade agreement. And we have that, as you know, uh, with Canada and Mexico. Um, then there's little different uh, levels of trade blocks in between. Again, we cover a lot of stuff in global business. The highest level of a trade block is an economic union, right? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Scratch that. I apologize. It's a political union. Uh, the European Union is been, you know, there's their next goal for the European Union is to, to be a political union. Probably not going to happen anytime soon because uh, all of the countries have to agree on um, one constitution, right? Uh, so imagine all of these European Union members agreeing on one constitution. They've already rejected the last that have been floating around. But so what the European Union is, it's the highest level of economic integration in the world. It is not a political union, it is an economic union. To understand what that means, uh, imagine if um, there was no border, no wall uh, between Mexico, US and Canada. You could drive in and out anytime. Imagine Canadian, Mexican, American worker uh, being allowed to work in the other place, no problem. Uh, imagine the currency, one currency instead of multiple different currencies. Uh, you could just trade the currency. Anyway, lots and lots of stuff like that, right? So I have a little graph here showing you the GDP at PPP, purchasing power parity. Basically, it's just a way of comparing the GDP uh, between these different countries. And what you see here, the United States GDP compared to India, compared to China. Uh, and uh, look at uh, the uh, gray area here for uh, the European Union, right? So it's showing you basically that together, the European Union economy is as big as the American economy, right? That's how they've really benefited. And there's some missing here, right? There's more. But just for now, that's fine. Um, so encourage trade relations among member countries. Regulate the trade and investment flow of non-member countries. So they create these blockades, right? So someone who wants to uh, export something from their country to one of the trade bloc members has to clear it. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to do because they want to protect the interest of the members. Includes the European Union uh, in Europe, uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, Mercosur. Uh, Mercosur is uh, currently uh, going through some changes, right? So the uh, biggest member of Mercosur, it's in uh, South America, is Brazil. Interestingly, not everybody, of course, is a member in South America. Uh, Chile is a huge economy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, one of the fastest growing, it's uh, GDP at PPP is high. It's not a member of Mercosur, but Venezuela was a member of Mercosur and with all the stuff that's been going on, Venezuela got dropped. Uh, ASEAN is interesting, it's, uh, it's in Asia and ASEAN, think of it as a counterweight to China. China is not a member uh, and uh, the United States is extremely interested in ASEAN, historically it has been. And uh, it's just kind of been a, a really a very uh, strategically important countermeasure. All right. Glob uh, the world trade has forged a network of, of, of global linkages, right? It binds countries, institutions, individuals very closely. Uh, global linkages have become more intense on an individual level. Communications has uh, built in new international uh, bridges. Just think about technology, uh, how we're doing this right now. Once I post this stuff on uh, YouTube, it's available anywhere in the world. Um, there's uh, really, the, there's always this kind of idea that in 1900, the world was huge, massive, 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 huge. And now the world is teeny tiny. Why? Well, because uh, it's just a lot faster and easier to connect with anyone anywhere in the world, right? Uh, transportation linkages that individuals from different countries see and meet each other with unprecedented ease, again, uh, flying anywhere. I mean, in Europe, it's cheaper 
to fly uh, within Western Europe. It's cheaper to fly from Spain to uh, Slovenia, to Ljubljana, uh, than uh, it is to take the train or uh, to rent a car or just about anything, right? Uh, and that's because competition over there is, is really on a different scale. But just an idea to let you know that, um, uh, yes, travel is cheaper than it's ever been, uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's easier for people to do that. World Trade is bringing about a global reorientation of corporate processes. Uh, you have New Horizons, these, these uh, corporations uh, uh, really taking advantage of uh, how easy it is uh, to trade uh, with countries. Uh, the global technological innovation uh, in marketing directly affects the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, business activities, right? Uh, and now, the, of course, the new era in the book, uh, the slides, uh, I should say, that we're using, uh, of course, the, the current relevant marketing uh, in developed countries especially, but throughout the world, is anything that has to do with uh, with uh, you know the uh, online media or the digital marketing? Um, it's uh, growing so fast that it's very difficult to keep up. Um, different competing technologies throughout the world. Uh, everybody, I'm sure here, of course, uh, when you think of a big online retail company, you think of Amazon, but Alibaba is bigger, right? Uh, Alibaba is a Chinese giant. They own Taobao. Um, when we think of our, our, our Black Friday and, uh, you know, wow, we broke some records. When you uh, dig a little bit deeper, you find out that uh, China has something called Singles Day and that Alibaba does better on Singles Day than we do on Black Friday. For those of you who are shocked about this, just remember that map we saw earlier, right? 1.5 billion people versus 300 plus million. Products are produced more quickly, uh, obtained less expensively from sources around the world. One of the words we use to describe that effect is specialization and commoditization, right? So when uh, a country has really, really excelled at making something, it becomes very popular with everybody else. And as such, uh, people buy it more. Therefore, the company makes more of it uh, to make sure that people continue to buy. It has to spend more money on research and development and efficiencies, which means that the cost of the good goes down because the cost of the good goes down, the price goes down. Because it's specialized, the quality goes up. Literally, you can buy the best product at the lowest price, right? So that's, that explains if you, if you think about a, a car made uh, with parts from sometimes over uh, or almost 100 countries, how is it possible that that car is cheaper made that way than if it was from parts in three neighboring countries at least? Uh, it's because of specialization, right? Uh, distributor at lower cost, I just talked about that. Customized to meet the diverse clients' needs. Because of technology, um, when you think about uh, mass production, right? Some of you will remember the old quote from Henry Ford. Uh, he once said, uh, you can have a car in any color as long as it's black. Uh, of course, he was interested only in production, how quickly he could make cars. Uh, now we have, with technology, something called mass customization. Uh, think about, you know, ordering a computer online uh, your way. You want a particular motherboard in there. You want, uh, you want the motherboard to be slapped with just what you want in there. But you don't want, it ha you don't want the price of a customized computer. You want the price of a regular, everyday computer. Because of mass customization, uh, companies like Dell have been able to do that for, for a while now, right? So things get customized. Uh, and by the way, I'm using computers. It could be anything. Shoes, you can customize the color of your Nikes, right? You can go online and you can build your own Nike with your own special colors. You'll pay for it, but uh, that's just kind of what's out there. Enables firm to separate their activities by content and context, right? Um, there's, again, I'm sorry, I'm using computers again, but if I go to the uh, IBM website or Dell website and I want to order a server, there's more than one way for me to get to the area with what kind of server I want to buy. Um, I can go to the area of Dell where I can say, uh, I work for uh, Chiffy College, we're a community college, uh, I, so I'm a government employee, and this is going to be for government use, for education. Uh, and so that's one way of getting in. Another way I could get in would be by budget. 
It could be by partnership. I have a strategic alliance with a company and uh, they use a specific kind of a software called SAP and um, SAP has a partnership with IBM. Therefore, now I can go through SAP through their website and get the product that I need that way. Uh, the level of global investment has resulted in the buildup of international debt by government. It's affected the national value of currencies and it's provided foreign capital for firms, right? It also has triggered a major foreign direct investment activity. So a lot's going on here. I added this to the slide because I kind of sometimes want to highlight some stuff. This is from 2016. Uh, and this is a cover from uh, The Economist magazine about uh, India and the growth of India. The current Prime Minister of India, uh, Modi, uh, has really done a lot to try to reform. He's, you know, not perfect. I mean, there's criticism out there about some of the stuff, uh, culturally specifically, uh, having to do with the Muslim population of India. Uh, uh, staying out of that, again, I just don't want to paint anybody as like the perfect person. But staying out of that and focusing on uh, what he's done since he's been elected has been to try to really open up the Indian economy by liberalizing it, right? And now what's happened because of that is that more and more uh, multinationals and countries and uh, uh, people are investing in India. They see a lot of potential there. Uh, and so we call that foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment is... It comes in several shapes. If a multinational decides I'm going to um, open up a factory, uh, if uh, Airbus, you know, uh, European consortium of uh, aircraft, right? They compete with Boeing. Uh, they opened up a factory in the United States. Now Airbus, uh, instead of, uh, usually they make their airplanes in Toulouse, France, south of France, and now they're making uh, their airplanes uh, in the United States. Well, how do we benefit again uh, we have people who now work there and um, and uh, and get paid by them, and they pay the taxes to the local state, the federal government, etc. That's foreign direct investment. Opening up a factory in a foreign country is one form of FDI. Another form of FDI is if you say, well, I don't want to open up a factory there, but here's what I'll do. I'll invest 30% in this existing company that has five factories. That way I can have a foothold there. That's another way. There's different ways of doing it. Um, as you can see from the chart, uh, the United States is usually number one destination for foreign direct investment. As long as we have a strong, vibrant, open economy, we get FDI. Uh, lately, we've been hurt because of political decisions. And so there are developed economies that are taking advantage of that because they're saying, hey, listen, uh, our policy is more liberalized, more open, and um, you don't have to uh, worry about uh, economic uncertainty because of things like tariffs or whatever. All right, increasing foreign investment in some key sectors have resulted in interdependence among nations, firms, and people. I just talked about that earlier. I think we're good there. It's kind of a review. Uh, realignment taking place on both micro and macro levels make past trade orientation part uh, partially obsolete. You know, we, we used to have what uh, was called more bilateral trade, right? When I started uh, studying business, um, we, you know, I studied international business, right? That's that's back then what it was called. Today, when uh, you think about, uh, the, well, the class itself is, is global business, right? This is international marketing, but global business. If you think about the idea of, uh, I think Coca-Cola, it's uh, uh, gross uh, profits, right? It's gross profits uh, are about 75%. 80% outside the United States, right? Nestle, uh, if you don't know where they're from, Nestle is a Swiss-based company. And last I heard, Nestle's gross profit, 3% of its gross profit came from Switzerland, its country of origin, right? And so we're beyond trade uh, from a bilateral standpoint between two or three or five countries. These are multinational corporations that are operating on a global scale. All right, um, the growth in the overall volume and value of both merchandise and service trade has a major impact on firms, countries, individuals. I think we, again, this is review. Uh, now, interesting. Uh, so uh, obviously you, you all know that uh, there are uh, negative repercussions to this in some circles, namely 
uh, with uh, in, in some political arenas, right? So policymakers find it difficult to isolate domestic economic activity from international market events. If someone has a really good understanding of how things work, they accept that we are interdependent. That's just the name of the game. And we have to play well with others, and sometimes we make concessions, sometimes we don't, whatever. Um, but um, in uh, some cases, uh, some leaders uh, will decide the best way to, uh, to deal with things is we're just going to be isolated, we're going to be independent, we're going to cut ourselves off from other countries and the rest of the world. And uh, we know economically that's just not true, it doesn't work that way. Um, and uh, and the, 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 the repercussions can be pretty dire, pretty negative. So that is one of the repercussions uh, that, that you will uh, discover when you look at that. Domestic policy measures are canceled out or counteracted by the activity of global market forces. Again, um, you, uh, your presence overseas, right? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, you know, um, you've probably heard a lot of uh, talk out there about um, uh, how the United States doesn't make stuff anymore. We don't manufacture, right? There's a... Uh, politically, um, large movement, big wave right now happening about, you know, uh, we should make more stuff in the United States. A couple issues there. Number one, uh, over three quarters of our gross domestic product um, is service-based. That's how this country works. That's how we've become where we are today, uh, leading economy in the world, not by making stuff, but by service. It's just the economy. Uh, why? Well, because we've discovered that um, we're better off letting other countries make stuff um, and divert their resources to do that, and let's try to divert our resources uh, toward um, things that give us a greater return on investment, right? And service is one of them. So um, let's see if I can show you this uh, real quick. Um, let me pause. All right, so. My question to you is, um, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the top three exporters in the world. What countries do you think export more than anybody else in the entire world, uh, almost 200 countries? So I want you to think about that and pause. And when you think you have the top three, hit play. All right, now that um, you've unpaused and you have your idea, look at the results. So the number one exporter in the world is China. The number two is the European Union. However, it is not ranked number two because it is not a country. Remember, we talked about that. It is an economic union, not a political union. If it ever were an economic union, I'm sorry, political union, then it would be a number two. So yes, the number two largest exporter in the world is the United States, which might surprise some of you because of all the stuff we hear that we just don't make stuff. Not only do we make a lot of stuff, but we're also the number two exporter in the world. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, technical difficulties. Here we go. Um, Domestic policy repercussions, again, still within the, the same uh, topic there. In the more recent past, currency flows have set exchange rates, which are the value of currencies relative to each other. So this is going to be a big deal. Uh, we've talked about, again, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep referring to global. I know more than half of you have already taken global. It is not a requirement for this class. It is recommended, but it's not a requirement. Um, and so the exchange rates obviously play a huge role in trade, right? Um, which, you know, it gets confusing. I know we have a whole chapter in Global about uh, what a strong currency means to trade and especially to export and things like that. Exchange rates have begun to determine the level of trade. All right, let me explain. Um, when the dollar is, uh, as, a, as, a, as an exchange rate, when the value of the dollar increases, it makes our goods, our products, more expensive for people outside the U.S. who want to buy our stuff, right? Just think of it that way. So a strong dollar 
sounds good because the word strong is in it. But if the goal, if the idea is for the US to export as many think that that should be a number one priority, uh, the issue with that is that having a strong dollar hurts that. It makes it very difficult, right? Um, and so exchange rates, the big, it's, it's a big deal. When you have a weak dollar, then of course you're, you're gonna export more. A lot of countries are gonna think like, hey, look, I can, uh, I, you know, I can buy more stuff uh, from the US there. Uh, think of, think of, in a different way, think about a family. Uh, let's use a British family, for example, and they want to go uh, travel, they want to go on vacation during the summer. They have several choices. And as they consider their choices, uh, they might decide, they look at uh, the uh, currency exchange rates. Uh, in England, uh, they use the pound, uh, and, uh, and in Europe, the European Union, for example, uh, there's an area called the Eurozone, where these are European Union members that use the euro. Well, the euro is weaker than the pound, right? Which means that it would be actually cheaper for that family to go to, um, you know, Euro Disney uh, in Paris than just about anywhere in England uh, because of the currency exchange rate being more favorable. Uh, even cheaper than that if uh, they came to the US uh, when the dollar was even weaker than the euro or the pound. So a weak dollar is good for the US if you want to export and it's also really good for the US if you want a bunch of tourists. All right. If you hate tourists, you want a strong dollar. Firms and countries are quick to emulate innovation and counteract carefully designed plans. So you don't want to celebrate too quickly when you come up with something new because very, very quickly they'll just try to do the same thing. Uh, when Apple came up uh, with the iPad, uh, within a month, all of these foreign competitors were trying to copy the iPad. Right? Uh, due to rapid technological changes and vast advances in communication, there's more to it um, because of what we talked about earlier, uh, this uh, concept of uh, specialization and commoditization. What that means is that um, if you think about, uh, let's use the example of IBM. Once upon a time, IBM was a company that made computers, right? In fact, the name IBM stands for International Business Machines. Well, uh, several years ago, IBM sold its computer division uh, entirely, its personal computers, uh, to a Chinese uh, manufacturer called Lenovo. Very, you know, many people were surprised, uh, but a lot of people who knew the industry understood that Lenovo was already making a lot of the components for IBM anyway. Um, and so just to kind of give you an idea how this stuff works, right? All right, domestic policy repercussion, here we go. This is another cover from The Economist. This was from uh, 2018, last year in March. Uh, all of this talk of tariffs, uh, it, it really scares the other countries, right? So governments are powerless to implement effective policy measures, and the policy makers have imposed regulations by means of trade barriers, tariffs, quotas, import regulations. And our current uh, administration is doing uh, plenty of that. We slap tariffs on lots and lots of countries. We slap tariffs on the European Union. We slap tariffs on... Uh, on uh, China, uh, Mexico, Canada, etc. Right, and so uh, what that all means is that it slows down trade, uh, and it uh, it makes things more expensive for us. Our disposable income goes down, um, and and by the way, since most of you uh, in my class live in the Inland Empire, it actually affects you more directly than just about anybody else. Let me give you a little bit of tidbit. Uh, the uh, Inland Empire economy is uh, extremely dependent on trade. Um, and the reason is that we're a corridor for trade, right? If you think about the two busiest ports on the West Coast, Port of LA, Port of Long Beach, all the stuff uh, that comes from Asia to the US lands in those two ports. Uh, if you had any type of uh, assembly required or sub-assembly or manufacturing or anything where you required a warehouse distribution center, you would like to be as close to those ships as possible, right? You get those containers off the ship, but then where do you want them? Well, you look at real estate and you look at the dollar per square foot and you realize LA is crazy expensive, Long Beach crazy expensive. So what you do is you say, let's keep going east until we find cheap places and 
Congratulations. What we have in the Inland Empire is considered to be cheap dirt. So this is why we have, you know, so many um, factories. Uh, we have uh, one out of every four people. Listen to this. One of every four people in the Inland Empire uh, works in distribution, warehousing, and logistics. Uh, the data comes from John Husing, who's a chief economist for the Inland Empire, and tracks that stuff. So what does that mean? It means that if we have a trade war with China, let's say the way that uh, we currently are in the process of having, unless it gets stopped, uh, what it means is that um, Chinese goods uh, won't be coming into the U.S. at the rate they've been going in. And if Chinese goods don't come to the U.S., they will not flow through this economic gauntlet that we have in the Inland Empire, which means that the people who drive the trucks, the forklifts, uh, work in the warehouse, all that stuff, they're not going to be working because they won't have any Chinese products uh, to be driving around so that they take them on to the East Coast, North Coast, South, whatever, right? Uh, just remember, we're, we're, we're kind of a through way for product that then ends up all over the U.S., right? And so this thing really affects the Inland Empire very, very directly. We're kind of a ground zero for trade war uh, because we feel it first. And if your parents uh, remember what uh, the recession was like not too long ago, and if you have anybody in your family who worked in warehousing, logistics, distribution, etc., uh, truck driving or anything like that, ask them what they were doing during the recession and uh, you will understand what the effect of a trade war means to them. Moving along, uh, domestic policy repercussions. So these measures uh, too have been restrained by international agreements that regulate trade restrictions. So what that means basically is we have, we have this thing called the World Trade Organization, right? And the way that this thing works is pretty cool. So let's go back to World War II. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, 1947, uh, if I'm not wrong, is uh, when the general agreement uh, on tariff and trade uh, is ratified a couple of years after the end of World War II. Uh, just look at the name of it. It's a GATT, right? General Agreement on Tariff and Trade. And what it does is it basically, the signatories of the agreement agree that they won't slap tariffs on each other. We talked about this earlier. Uh, the problem with GATT was it could not have foreseen uh, the limitations uh, that it would have uh, based on two things, technology and globalization, right? And uh, the limitation uh, became so restrictive and prohibitive that GATT eventually uh, was morphed from an agreement into an organization. And uh, instead of calling the general agreement, it became the world trade organization. So the... Um, if you think about uh, the foundation of the World Trade Organization, the articles uh, of the WTO are all GATT articles, right? And uh, what now, having understood that, what does it mean if a member of the World Trade Organization uh, does something that another member thinks is unfair, right? So. Uh, the number one manufacturer of avocado um, in the world is uh, Mexico, right? Uh, by a long shot. I mean, nobody comes close. There's like basically no number two. Uh, if you think of California avocado, it's not even one tenth of the production of Mexican avocado in the world. And 50% uh, of all of those delicious Mexican avocados are consumed by Americans. And now we're about to slap tariffs on those things. Uh, well, actually, let me recap. We did slap tariffs on those things. But now if we do close the border, they're talking about uh, avocados not coming in, although that's a different story. But if we slap the tariff on um, Mexican uh, avocados, right, and we have a, a trade agreement with Mexico that says we wouldn't do stuff like that, Mexico then could go to the World Trade Organization and say, hey, look, this is an unfair tariff. We're just more efficient. We have, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of avocados. California doesn't have as much. And that's why our avocados are cheaper. And that's why we're able to sell them all over the place. So uh, if the World Trade Organization said, you know what, you're right. The uh, U.S. Um, has no right to slap a tariff. Then they would rule uh, against us. 
And and the WTO has ruled against the U.S. before, uh, when W. Bush was uh, president of the United States, he slapped a tariff pretty much on the world, and um, many countries uh, went to the WTO to complain that the steel tariff was unfair, and it was the first time in its existence that the WTO ruled against the U.S. and told us we had to cease and cease um, slapping tariffs on uh, foreign steel. All right, moving along. Um, the global market imposes increasingly tight limits on national economic regulation and sovereignty. And that's the thing. Uh, because you want to be part of the global economy, because trade is going to help you economically, trade makes everything go round. My friends in political science, uh, you know, they talk about things like sovereignty. And sovereignty, you know, is the ability to control your economy by different means, uh, the legal, the political, the economic, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if, I, if I'm overly dependent on other countries for my economy, it's scary. Uh, and what it also means is that I'm not going to be able to regulate myself as much as I'd like to because uh, I need them, right? Um, this, uh, this is playing out right now, actually, uh, the idea of sovereignty and economic sovereignty is playing out as we speak in Greece. Uh, Greece uh, is recovering from bankruptcy, the economy is not doing great, uh, they've been trying to uh, improve. Uh, if you think about the American economy, and if you think about us and how we handle a looming recession, we have several mechanisms available to us. Uh, one of them, for example, is we can uh, decrease the, the prime rate, right? We decrease the interest rate and uh, many people refi their homes and it uh, stimulates spending, etc., right? Well, Greece can't do that. And the reason it cannot do that is because it's part of the European Union. And so the central bank of the European Union is in Germany and uh, the prime rate of that uh, bank is... Uh, 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 designed or uh, um, set uh, by, uh, well, Germany has a lot of control, but other EU members. And so Greece cannot control its currency. It cannot control, it does not have its own currency. The euro is controlled by the central bank and European Union. So Greece indeed has lost so uh, sovereignty. It's not able uh, to come out of its economic morass as quickly as it would like because of its interdependence uh, on uh, the European Union. Um, let's see, domestic policy still, uh, closer economic relations result in many positive effects, but the interdependence bring risk, again, a recap, dislocation of people and economic resources, uh, this is playing out in the European Union, a decrease in a nation's capability to do things its own way, again, the interdependence uh, uh, prevents you from doing that. Because in this case, you're not catering to your own populace. Uh, you're catering to a market that's greater than that, and you become interdependent uh, as well on uh, your producers. The key task for the international marketer is to stimulate societal acceptance of the long-term benefit of interdependence. Um, and that's a tough one. Uh, there's stuff we're going to talk about later on uh, that also add to this uh, challenge. For example, if you think about uh, the American products uh, that are exported throughout the world, right? Think of Hollywood, right? Think of Hollywood. Think about American movies uh, being played and shown all over the world. So the idea here is that we're not just exporting, uh, you know, a, a uh, entertainment. We're also exporting culture, right? And so there's this notion uh, of uh, this... Um, uh, uh, export of our culture throughout the world, which then challenges the national local culture and uh, can threaten uh, the local culture as such, right? Um, uh, opportunities and challenges uh, to handle newly emerging forces and dangers for, of unforeseen influences from abroad. Uh, the firm needs to be prepared and develop active responses. So smart companies uh, always have really pretty amazing contingency plans, right? If this happened, we do that, etc. They envision new strategies, strategies, a long-term plan. I know those of you who took management, you've learned a lot about uh, strategic planning. 
SWOT analysis, VRIO, BCG matrix, stuff like that. And so what a lot of these companies do is they hedge their bets. They do a lot of stuff. Um, uh, currency uh, manipulation, they are, you know, cutting deals, uh, either uh, not in domestic currency or the home currency, but sometimes in other third party currency. Uh, sometimes they will buy product uh, uh, in, and they will lock prices based on a particular timeline. I mean, there's really lots and lots and lots going on in terms of strategies, distribution strategy, pricing strategy, you name it. They develop new plans. Uh, they change uh, the way of uh, doing business. Again, kind of uh, what I've just described, um, take real estate alone and how that has changed, right? I can list my house on Zillow and sell it on my own. Uh, I just have to make sure I find a good escrow company that walks me through. But that's available. Uh, you, you know, there, there's lots that's going on in the world where, uh, you know, if you think about what we do in the U.S. and how that's affected other countries, uh, some of them are resisting it. Um, when was the last time any of you uh, went to um, a travel agent? To book a trip overseas, right? Probably not many. You go online, Travelocity, whatever, and you do it that way. You don't deal with that uh, person. Uh, in this case, the cost benefit is yes, they add value because they know a lot of stuff, but you're paying more. And many people are deciding I can find those resources in online different way, skip the middleman, save money. Um, the growth of global business activities offers increased opportunities. Again, kind of a recap we talked about. Knowledge transfer around the world helps an international firm to build and strengthen its competitive position. Uh, and so the knowledge transfer is an interesting concept, right? It's uh, this, whatever it is that uh, it could be the computer industry, uh, anything that you're doing when you decide to go overseas uh, for indirect investment, you have a division, we call them uh, strategic business units. You're operating there and uh, you are transferring this knowledge, you're transferring this technology. And what it's going to do is, you know, this is where it gets scary, cost-benefit analysis. I have a position uh, in a foreign land, I'm increasing my market share there, but I am spreading some of my knowledge which can uh, bring about uh, potential competition. There's a case study uh, that's out there of Pizza Hut. For those of you in Global, it was in the book. Pizza Hut decided to have franchises in Thailand, and so it cut a deal with a bunch of franchisees. These guys come in, they're running their own local Pizza Huts, they think it's the best thing. But then they start to question, like, well, hold on, that's it? That's They just taught us how to make pizza, and we use their name and their menu, and it's very easy. So they decided to create their own uh, company called The Pizza Company uh, and um, what uh, Pizza Hut alleged is that they stole a lot of their concepts and ideas and know-how, uh, you know, how to how to run a franchise, a business, etc. Uh, Pizza Hut lost in the Thai court, um, but, uh, but that was a risk they took, right? Uh, let's see, uh, international opportunities require careful exploration uh, an awareness of global developments. Again, you want to see which way the winds are shifting, blowing. Um, China is on fire, people. Uh, for those of you who are following uh, the um, Chinese uh, developments right now, very, very uh, impressive uh, strategy that China has right now with its road and belt uh, development program. We'll talk more about it later on, but not so much in this class as we did uh, in Global. It's not in the book, uh, but um, China is um, taking advantage of, uh, I guess, a void that uh, we, the US, have uh, left behind as we're just uh, walking away from uh, deals and uh, severing ties and things like that. China is seeing opportunities, so it's uh, it's been pretty clever in, uh, in, uh, in recently, actually, uh, if you want to research it after the presentation here, uh, you can research China, Italy um, uh, deal. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a very significant thing because uh, Italy is a member of the European Union 
and it's not allowed to have like these bilateral agreements without having to go through the EU first. But China, uh, Xi Jinping went to Italy and cut a deal exclusively with China, kind of a cooperation, an economic type cooperation that didn't go well very, with the European Union. Anyway, I'm giving you can like this little aside to let you know that this is one example of a global development that is happening right now uh, with China, India the same way. Uh, you know, um, the world is going to be moving around no matter what happens. And uh, the idea as a marketing professional who wants to take advantage of it is, is exactly where the opportunities are, what's the risk, what's the cost benefit, how much am I willing to lose, what's the best way of going there. And we'll do a lot more of that, right? What's the best formation? Uh, what's the best um, way to plan out your long-term, middle-term, uh, and short-term, right? So strategies are long-term, mid-term will be more like of your tactics, and your operational plan is more of like the immediate day-to-day short-term. Uh, you need to understand the meaning, right, of uh, those explorations and developments, capabilities to adjust to change. Uh, some companies are just really brilliant at um, adapting and reacting to change better than others, right? Um, I always use the example of, uh, you know, Borders versus Barn and Nobles. I know it's a domestic example, but uh, one saw change as uh, something to resist and fight. The other one saw change as something to embrace. Uh, and of course, one's alive, one's not alive. Um, there's a lot different there uh, different case studies out there as to what really went wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, just think about technology in this case, right? Uh, well, that concludes uh, chapter one. I hope that you find this useful. Please uh, make sure that um, for now, use the PowerPoint slides as your study guide. Uh, I give you a lot of additional information above and beyond the slides uh, to to elaborate on the slides with uh, some concepts, critical thinking application. Uh, what I want to do for your class, uh, because of the limitations that we have had uh, with the technology and the ebook and all that stuff, since I will not require the textbook in this class. If you have it, congratulations, you're, you're set. If you don't, the slides will be sufficient uh, for you, I believe, uh, as you will use them as a study guide. Uh, all right, everybody, have a, have a great evening or day. Do me a favor. Um, there's a little area below YouTube there for feedback, comment. I want to hear from you because I want to make sure I'm doing this uh, in the most optimal manner. Uh, if I'm going too fast, too slow, anything, the lighting, I have no idea. Um, let me know. Give me some feedback. All right. I'll see you guys.